Well, hey, what do you say we get started? <clears throat> um, so, guys, welcome to another Tuesday night. Uh, love to have you here. Love to uh, uh, chit chat with you about underwriting or quick underwriting. And, uh, you know, we're going to we're just going to dive right in. So, Will, man, why don't you uh, do the honors and, and get us uh, kick us off here, man? Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome. And uh, we're glad to have you guys. Uh, let's go ahead and we can go to the next Zoom. We're going to just kind of talk uh, a little bit about what we're going to be talking about here tonight. But, man, we're just glad to have you. And uh, so here's today's agenda. And uh, so uh, we're going to start out uh, a little introduction here, uh, who we are, and we want to hear who you are. And uh, go ahead and make sure to throw your information in the chat. We want to know who you guys are. Uh, throw in, in the chat what your superpower is what you're all about. We want, to, we want to learn more about you, but we're looking forward to getting to know you guys tonight and also, uh, of course, introducing ourselves. Um, and, and once we uh, have some introductions, then we're going to go into our community ecosystem, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about who we are at the Multifamily Freedom Chasers and uh, kind of what we're all about. And uh, tonight, we're actually going to be talking about uh, our rent rolls and revenue and how to read a rent roll. And, uh, you know, we always like to add a little uh, uh, informational, educational section to our, to our, uh, our Zoom. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about rent rolls this evening. So uh, if, uh, if, you're learn if you're wanting to learn how to read a rent roll or learn hopefully something new about them tonight, that's what we're going to talk to you about this evening. And then it is time to get out your napkins. And uh, that's what this Zoom is all about, about learning how to quickly analyze deals with our napkin uh, analyzer. And so we are, uh, we're excited to, uh, to hopefully get into some deals with you guys. If you have a deal, uh, throw a one in the chat. We'd love to, uh, again, if, if there's a deal you'd like for us to uh, uh, underwrite this evening, if you feel comfortable doing so, again, you can keep it as confidential as you want to, but uh, if you have a deal that you'd like for us to take a look at this evening, we'd love, uh, love to do that. And if not, Ed will pull one up from, uh, from his, from his uh, boneyard that he has of all these deals that he's never been able to, to close on, unfortunately. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're going to, uh, but we will bring one up. So, Ed, you know, I love you, brother. But uh, and then after that, we'll open it up for some questions and answers. So, guys, we're glad you're here this evening. Welcome to uh, to another evening with uh, with Ed, Aldo, and myself. So, with that, we're going to go to the next slide. So, who are we, Ed? Tell us who you are, man. Uh, good question. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Edward Shamarian, as many of you know, based out of Los Angeles, uh, everyone's favorite place to visit. Um, and all the favorite place on earth. This is his Disneyland. <laughs> and uh, I'm a licensed realtor in California, looking to invest anywhere and everywhere. Um, yes, I am crazy enough to invest in my backyard. Yes, I'm also crazy enough to invest in your backyard, even though I have to fly to get there. So there's nowhere I won't go for a deal because everywhere's far from me and everywhere it takes a plane ride. So um, yeah, let me know how I can help. I love connecting with people. Um, love handling the asset management, creative strategies and offering and underwriting and uh, talking to brokers and all that fun stuff. So let me know if I can help in any way. Um, if you're ever out in LA, hit me up. Love, love to connect and meet you guys in person. Uh, one of these days, I'll get out to the East Coast and join y'all on a, um, at an event. But in the meantime, I'm enjoying the weather out here. Love it. Well, thanks, Ed. Um, and I feel like I kind of have to like reintroduce myself because I haven't been on these Zooms here for so long, but uh, it is good to be on with you all this evening. Uh, I'll quickly introduce uh, myself and, and my business partner, Aldo, uh, Aldo and Chetta. And uh, we are the co-founders of Stoic Holding Solutions. We are based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, we are just a couple of dudes that uh, in college decided to get into senior living and uh, realized that, hey, we love it, but uh, we want more out of life. And so uh, we started uh, really diving very head deep into multifamily. And uh, here we are. 
and uh, we are excited to be here with you guys this evening. We're just a couple of, uh, of fathers. Uh, we have two beautiful wives. Aldo has two beautiful little children, a little girl and a boy, and uh, I have a little four-year-old daughter. And uh, so we, uh, we, we still have our W-2 that we work every single day. Uh, however, we are ready to find that freedom that uh, multifamily can bring. So we're excited to be here this evening with you guys. Good to see some familiar faces. Uh, Mario, good seeing you, brother. Welcome tonight, man. Uh, always good seeing you, brother. So, uh, but with that, we want to get to know about a little bit about you. And I, I know there was a few ones that uh, were in the chat for being your first time here. Uh, Dana, I know you've kind of talked a little bit already. Love for you to maybe introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, if uh, if you're still on. So uh, I think for everyone that was here, I'm going to repost them, but I put two links in the chat. Um, essentially, if you're new, haven't filled it out before, fill out the form and then uh, mark that spreadsheet. Uh, that's our kind of our community spreadsheet. It allows everyone um, to put their info, connect with others, um, and just, hey, if you need help in a specific city and you're not familiar with it, someone on that list will be able to help you. So check that out. Good deal. Anyone okay. want to enter? Okay. There you oh, go. Yeah, man. You said you, oh, okay. <laughs> I called you out yeah, when so, you didn't have your video on, man. No, nah, no, nah, no, nah, my bad. I had to run out of room. So, yeah, so um, as you can see, I'm Dana Jones. Um, I own a mortgage company out here. So, me and Ed, we're going we're gonna to link up, um, I guess, one day next week or something like that, because I own a mortgage company out oh. here in LA. I'm actually in Sherman Oaks. So, like, probably like 30 minutes from LAX. So, <laughs> I do mortgages for a multi family. My wife, she does the residential portion. Uh, we invest. So um, multifamily intrigues me because like I said, I do the mortgages for them, but I own like a lot of single families back in Baltimore, Maryland and Augusta, Georgia. So I'm looking to get into multifamily in all of like the Sunbelt states. So I'm in sub two. So I already know how to, I already know the ways to get multi, I mean, single family subject to a seller finances. So I'm looking to take the towns I do in single family and bring it over to the multifamily realm. And then in multifamily, I'm noticing that a lot of people are going from single family to multifamily. So I say, hey, it'd be a nice thing to do the loans and also invest in it as well too. So I can actually grow that generational wealth for my kids and generations that come after that, you know? And that's what it's all about. Good deal, man. Dana, hey, glad to have you, brother. Welcome. Thanks, man. Thanks and, for having uh, me. Here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. So anyone else uh, want to introduce themselves this evening? Feel free to take yourself off, off mute. We'd love to get to know a little bit more about you and where you're at. Adrian, what's up, man? I didn't know you was over here. I was just about ready to call it, Adrian. So, oh, Adrian. Look, 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 look. I didn't mean to interrupt, but Adrian, <laughs> that's my good guy right there. Sub two, two. I just talked to him the other day. <laughs> What's going on, I'm man? I'm following you, Adrian. I'm following you, man. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'll introduce myself real quick. So, yeah, my name is Adrian Gillis. I'm out of the DMV area, D.C., Maryland, Virginia. Um, I've been in real estate since 2019. Started off wholesaling. Um, probably been in multifamily uh, almost a year now. Uh, we recently, me and my team, we recently got our first property uh, that we're going to close on August 15th. We were super excited about that. And we got uh, a couple other ones in the pipeline as well that we're looking to underwrite. And hopefully those will be deals for us as well. But um, my role in our team is broker relations. So I'm calling brokers and just getting as many deals in, building relationships with as many brokers as I can, get on their list for them to send us deals so we can just keep on building. Um we, we were looking to build an empire here. So we're looking to get as much cash flow and much passive income as we can uh, so we can pass it down to our families after we're gone. So that's a real quick story about me. I mean, also in sub two, sub two, sub two. Um, Pace Morby is amazing. He's taught us a lot. Um, I definitely don't regret joining his mentorship. Uh, can't, can't wait to, uh, uh, to see what else comes out of uh, everything that we're doing. So yeah, glad to be here, and I appreciate y'all. Just looking to learn as much as possible tonight. Nice, man. Well, we love Pace, too. And, uh, man, with a background like that, you're you're going to be going far, brother. I like that. I think it looks good. So, uh, anyway, hey, guys, we are glad to uh, have each and every single one of you all here. Welcome. Uh, Dana and Adrian, appreciate you guys uh, introducing yourselves. And uh, yeah, we're... Uh, with that, we're going to kind of get into a little bit of our topic this evening. 
And um, so, Aldo, feel free to take it from here, man. Yeah, and that before a few uh, words from our sponsors here. Uh, no, uh, want to lay out the journey of the multifamily freedom chasers really quick before we get into our topic. You know, we've talked about this. This really lays it out well. So we have a community and we have an ecosystem that you guys can be a part of and it's free and we love for you to be on here, right? But there is a journey that, you know, a, a, a multifamily freedom chaser takes and this is where it's laid out. And so essentially there are, there are three paths uh, for everyone that comes here and, and you know, joins or, and listens to us and becomes a part of our, our community. You know, you come in, you see everything, you taste it, you enjoy it for a little bit and you say, Thanks for the free education. This was awesome. But you know what? Real estate's just not for me. I don't want to be in operations and neither do I want to be an investor. So you know what? I'm going to pursue something else. Respect, respect. Go do what you love to do and find it. We hope you find it and we hope you crush it. Uh, the second stage or the second group is, you know, I love multifamily real estate. It's awesome. It's great. I love all this free education. And the only thing is that I don't want to become an active investor. I don't want to become an operator. It's a lot of work. I don't want to do it. So what I want to do is here, I've got some cash or I know some people with cash and um, I'll invest it passively into you guys' deal. Well, great. Welcome. We need money, right? We all, we all need a little bit of money. And if you have it, let's put it to work together. Um, you know, one of the advantages that you would have if you're in that bucket coming here is you learn and understand how to look and under uh, and underwrite or analyze deals. You you look at how well the really the the entire process of multifamily uh, real estate from acquisition to asset management all the way through to to closing. You can you can learn that here even as a passive investor, and it's very important because you want to get into deals that make sense and that are going to make you money and that you can corroborate that. Hey, yep. You can make money on this one. So that's bucket number two. Bucket number three is, hey, I also love multifamily real estate. And I do want to be an active multifamily investor. I want to be an operator. And I'm ready. I am ready for this. So what I'm going to do is take advantage of all of this free information and this free education that I'm getting here. And I'm going to learn as much as possible. But there is going to be a, a point at which you, you get to and say, hey, uh, thank you guys for the free education. It was awesome. It was great. But I need, I need the next level. I need the next level. I need, I need the gay bowlings of the world. You know, I need the rock leaves of the world. I need these people that have been doing this for years and years and years and that have millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in assets under management. You know what? Awesome. We want to provide that for you. We want to offer you that. And so we have come up with a multifamily freedom chaser preferred partners program. And it's uh, as a multifamily freedom chaser, you get to take advantage of that. And I'm going to show you here a little bit video a, in a little bit, a video of one of uh, our freedom boys talking to you about what that program looks like and how you can take advantage of that really quickly. Multifamily Freedom Chasers family, I have exciting news for you all. We are launching our preferred partners program for the community. You as a community member, as a Freedom Chaser, have access to this right now for free. So what is the preferred partners program? It is a program designed when you are ready to accelerate your multifamily real estate journey. You are ready to invest in yourself, to level up your education, and business building experience. This is the place to go. These are the partners and resources that we have invested into and we use hands-on that have helped us level up in our multifamily journey. So pretty cool. Our preferred partners that are part of this list, it, it continues to grow, but right now they have over $2 billion of assets under management. Super cool. High level teams and high level operating individuals. So let me walk you through this here really quickly. We have Gabe Bowling's real estate training, Mastering Multifamily with Vina Jetty with her educational vault, Rockstar Capital and Robert Martinez. They have several different educational options. If you need mindset and performance coaching, we got Keston Glasgow with Purpose Ways. The Mary Machine website, funnels, marketing, everything you need there. Self-directed retirement, uh, 
services with Horizon Trust, CRM, an underwriting multifamily course with Ken Gee himself. And then if you don't have the funding, but you're ready to accelerate your multifamily journey and invest in yourself and invest in your business, we have DC Global Enterprises where you can get no interest funding to fund those type of investments. So take advantage of the Preferred Partners Program of the Multifamily Freedom Chasers, and let's continue our chase for freedom together. Thanks, Trevor. Appreciate you saying that. Uh, just really quickly, I want to make sure you guys understand that um, this preferred program is a way not only it's it's not for for this community to go out and, and get rich, right? It's for us to be able to continue to provide the the services that we provide to you and provide you uh, a discount to this. So what we do is, is essentially we we take uh, you know the fee that you that you would get from uh, the affiliate link. We basically split that with you, and we we make sure that you guys have um, an avail and uh, you guys have the availability of taking advantage of this at a lower cost than it would you know anybody else. So we want to share that and 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 throw some cost savings your way as well, and uh, make sure that you are set up well, not only with you know next level next level partners or, or next level people that are able to able to teach us uh, a little bit deeper but people that we have vetted ourselves people that we as the multifamily freedom chaser uh, leadership group have vetted themselves and uh, a lot of these if not all of these folks uh, somebody has gone through their their education and has vetted it and uh, we we stand behind what they say and teach and would have actually taken it ourselves. So uh, with that said, I want you guys to know and understand that these aren't just affiliate links that we're throwing out there. These are these are real, real people with real content that we want to offer to you if you want to take the next step into real estate. So with that said, um, wanted to... I want to add something real quick to that. Uh, most of the oh, people... Can you hear me? Yep, yeah. Right. I just want to add real quick, most of the people that have uh, are part, were preferred partners with have also been on the Sunday night, which you guys can see here on the schedule, the Sunday Zoom calls with the uh, Freedom Guys. So they've taken their time, already committed time to the community. They've told their story. They've kind of built in as well and like given that credibility piece to where you you have all seen them on a call. You've been able to relate to them. They've answered questions already for a lot of people in the community. Um, and what I'm going to do right now, and I'm pulling it up, is I'm going to put our um, uh, YouTube page so you can find old videos. So if you may have, if you're interested in someone's preferred program, um, like the underwriting or whatever's offer, you always get a chance to hear them out before and be like, hey, I, I didn't, wasn't there that Sunday. Let me go check out how that call went. And it, it'll able give you more access to them and uh, relate to them a little better. Right. Thanks, Ed. Appreciate that. Um, with that said, this is our ecosystem. You guys know it. You understand it. We have, you know, throughout the week program free, free of charge programs for you guys to learn, to learn and understand the basics of multifamily uh, real estate investment. On Sundays, we get kicked off with the Freedom Boys with the activation Zoom with several of the people that Ed mentioned here, a lot of rock stars, basically. And literally, we have the apartment rock star on here, um, two-time apartment manager, winner of uh, of the year. And, um, and then as the week progresses, on Mondays, we have broker talks with Ed and also with Pete. And they show you how to uh, network well with brokers and be able to find information that you need and also develop the relationships that you need in order to get good deals. Once you have a deal from a broker, then you bring it here. We can help you understand whether it's a good deal or not quickly. Um, and then you progress on to the next day with uh, alternating weeks. We we'll have uh, the, the Miles family and they talk about the state of the debt market. And they talk to you about how to get debt, what what debt is, and what the cost of debt, and, and several different debt vehicles. Uh, a really good Zoom. And then, of course, on the other alternating week, we have our very own Victor, uh, who goes into 
more detailed, more advanced underwriting uh, on alternating weeks. So with that, our contact information, if you uh, have any questions about underwriting or just want to uh, pen pal us, just kidding. Just, you know, if, if you have any questions on, on deals or, or need help on underwriting anything, we'd be happy to help. All right. With that, we're going to go ahead and uh, give it up to uh, Ed for a few minutes to kind of go over uh, the rent rule, a very important, very, very important part of the underwriting piece. So, Ed, take it away, man. Cool. Um, just checking, make sure you guys can hear me. I have to do like a dual, um, a little bit of a video here. But um, yeah, so when it comes to the multifamily space, the most common documents you're going to be, from a lender's perspective especially, but anytime you're either going to be the one underwriting or passing a long term underwriter, the most common documents that you're going to um, have thrown around is rent roll and T12. The OM helps, but again, you always remember the OM is broker generated. So rent roll and T12 if done properly and accurately are the most accurate documents you will have. And it will essentially paint the picture and tell the story of the current situation of the building, which means how many vacant units do you have? How far off of market rents or the current rents. Um, how long have your tenants been there? As you can see on here, you have the lease start date and the lease expiration date. That is much more important than I think people, um, I, I've, a lot of people I've talked to have given that credit to. That column is very important and I'll get into why later. Um, and also, are they caught up? Which some rent rolls have, um, but hopefully it, most of the rent rolls you look at has if they have an outstanding balance if they have a um if they're behind what their situation is and also tells you like are they section eight or they low income it really just explains who the tenant is and sometimes it even has their name which i don't want to get too far into it but when you go through due diligence you got to make sure those match and that's another monster for another day but you really want to make sure that your rent roll is accurate and up to date so that your lender can properly also quote you the right debt. Um, and as Miles family has probably mentioned on their calls and you guys can check those out on uh, every other Wednesday, it's really important to have these documents beforehand, um, not only so that you can prepare for it and underwrite the deal, but so that your lenders are ready to go and you know what else you need from them. Um, it, it, Keeping that communication and update and always having the what you need and what they need from you available is very important. Um, if you're missing stuff, it's just gonna cause more delays and issues and um, that's, that's not fun. Uh, one thing you'll also notice on here is utility charges. So if there's any bill back program, rubs, anything else like that, um, there, it sometimes does show on the rent roll and how it's allocated. Now, Keep in mind, you may see differences. You may see some units that don't have it and some that do. You, will, for everyone who was on the broker call and has been on the broker call, when I say having the rent roll and the T12 allows you to ask questions, to sh one, show the broker, hey, I know what I'm talking about. But two, say, hey, I'm not just calling you to waste your time. I've already spent time and done my homework on this property. I'm calling you with intention and purpose. And that's the biggest thing when it comes to the space. You don't want to call a broker just to call a broker um, without intention. And also when you have answers you can control, or questions you need answered and you can control the conversation, it shies away from all the questions you may be too nervous they ask you, to be honest. So for example, I can go through this very and I'll probably think of like five questions to ask them. And maybe it's stuff I even know, but it's things that I'm like, Hey, can you tell me a little bit about this? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, for example, the studio is not renovated. Why? What's the condition? When was it renovated? Is it weird that there's a random studio out of those units? Maybe. You know, it's, it's just getting to know the property better. Because remember, this is the first step to a marriage with this property. You're going to have possibly forever, but at least for the time of the deal. And that's not like a 
few months like it is in single family. That's a long time. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. You really need to understand the numbers because this is what you're also going to be telling your investors. So you might be thinking, oh, underwriting is not my thing, but I love raising capital. Well, you need to know this. Your investors care about this stuff. What does it look like today? What are your average rents? What's your occupancy rate? Um, what's the upside? Is it a, and here's an important question that I think you should always ask, always ask a broker is, are the rents low because they haven't increased them? Like it's just poor management or is it low because the, the condition is bad? Maybe it's not updated. Those are two very different questions. If you see here on the lease start date, a lot of the leases started in 2022. Now, I would go a step further and ask the broker, are those renewals or are those new tenants? Two very different conversations. What I mean by that, if those are renewals and they put the renewal date on the lease start date, one of those tenants could have been there for 15 years and you don't know it. That means their unit has not been upgraded for 15 years. If you're trying to rent something at market rent, that's not going to fly. Like, you're not getting today's rent on a property that hasn't been updated in that long. Also, you may have other issues. You don't know. All of a sudden, it's a unit of concern now. Your budget increases. So that's it's really important to be able to understand all that um, and see where areas of opportunities are and how that timeline affects your underwriting. Another way that it affects uh, underwriting is when you look at the expiration date, we always prepare and we always look at properties that we want to value at. Well, the biggest way to value add is to rehab, right? Well, if I have a high occupancy rate, I don't have many vacant units and none of my leases are ending soon, guess what I'm not doing? Rehab. So if I see on the lease expiration date, a lot of these are just on this little snippet right here, there's not many that have well, I guess by the time you close escrow, technically a lot of them will be expiring. But if let's say I got into escrow and I purchased this and I closed the beginning of July, there's still a good amount that are active. See, there you go, the moving date. I think that's very important. This railroad has it, sometimes they don't. But um, what I was saying about the lease expiration, you want to know, hey, are these tenants coming out? Like July 6th, right? That was 12 days ago. But what, what's been the conversation like? Does a tenant want to stay? Are you increasing their rents? Are you, um, if you have a good management company, hopefully they are at least a little bit. Um, and one thing that I've seen a lot of uh, operators offer their tenants is, hey, if you sign an extension three months before your lease ends, we'll give you a little bit of a break on the increase in rent we're going to do if you waited three months. Why is that? Because a two to three to four week turnover can cost you more than the amount in rent difference. Keep that in mind as well. So what's the turnover period gonna look like? What are the conditions of these properties? And how soon can I actually do the rehab to improve these units? That, that's the biggest goal. Now, <laughs> I live in California, so I'm a little traumatized with the whole uh, getting tenants out um, component of this business, but it, it is still something you're going to have to deal with anywhere. Um, and you just want to make sure that you're prepared for it and you still have the opportunity to rehab these units. Um, the other thing you want to be careful of, if you see a lot of these leases were signed around the same time and they're ending around the same time, if you get a huge volume of vacancies at one point, that's terrifying. Like you need to be prepared for that or get enough of them expended beforehand where you don't have 20% vacancy happen overnight. Is it unlikely? I hope. Can it happen and should you prepare for it? Absolutely. Um, there's nothing worse than telling to your investor, hey, we can't um, distribute this month because we have 20 vacancies. They're like, how did you not prepare for that? You know, and you could... It's crazy to think on a single simple rent roll, you can see that and so many different things you can prepare for through um, just this document. Um, also, when it comes to the utility charges, 
you also want to make sure that's accurate and matches what is on their T12 and it's not exaggerated on the T12 so the numbers look better, for example. Um, also, so this is just a little nitpick more than anything. When you're looking at the market rent and the current rent, um, make sure you're only adding up the occupied units. That sounds crazy, but I've seen people put their current rent on vacant units as the market rent. And it's like, yeah, that sounds great, but it's not currently occupied. Make sure you could you dis distinguish and differentiate those. Um, one more thing I would do, and I, I think this is kind of my last point on the rent roll, um, but if you, and I, we, we say this almost every week, I feel like, make sure you know the market you are looking to purchase in. Ask other property management companies, obviously, or you can do a, a surprise phone call to them and act like you're just a curious party or uh, you're not necessarily looking at this property and talk to property management companies. You want to know what the wait list is like. You want to know how many people are running to the three bedroom, one bathrooms in this area at 840 square feet. You want to know 680 square foot, two bedroom, one bath. What is the interest like? And at what dollar amount are they marketing? Um, the rent roll doesn't really show this. It's my, it might be more of a T12 thing, but if something's been vacant, find out how long and why. Like, yeah, is it? do I expect you to be at I don't, 112 units? Are you going to be at 100% occupancy? No. Would you like to? Actually, you might not want to. Then your rents might be too low. But do you want to know why you have vacancies? Absolutely. And I think that's the biggest part, because if you don't know why, then you don't know how to improve the property. Um, any questions or anything else to, um, on the rent rolls that you guys have experienced yourselves or have questions about or are just curious in regards to what this all means? My guy, Mario, go for it. Hey, Ed, just, uh, just a nugget I picked up on another call just in reference to the rent roll, but also how to incorporate uh, pivot tables just to summarize the data a bit ba better. So like they created pivot tables for the rents to see exactly how many people were, how, how many were occupied, how many were vacant. And what really prompted the thought uh, just to share is when you're talking about lease expiration, so you also had a way you could create a pivot table to show how many leases were going to expire uh, so you can do a quick audit, but also for start date as well, lastly, to see how long the tenants have been there. Are they all brand new? Have you had long-term tenants? So all the information you shared was great, but if someone wanted to take it to a different level, uh, just being able to incorporate the pivot tables to quickly summarize what's here is also just something I wanted to mention. Yeah, definitely. And, and actually, Olo just pulled it up. The floor plan, I think, is important, too. So you have an idea of you want a good variety of unit mix. Now, mm -hmm. what I love for every unit to be the biggest, most spacious um, and most square footage so I can collect the most rents. Eh, no, actually, I wouldn't because you have to, again, it goes back to knowing your market. Depends where. If I'm near, if I'm, uh, I don't know, near a big college campus, Maybe I want more room so I can rent some of them out per room to students. Um, one bedrooms may not be as ideal, but there may be some areas where you have like near military or army or Nate or anything like that. And um, those single units might go better. I don't know, We're just throwing examples out there. So knowing the unit mix is important because of one, how quickly can I fill it? And is that area even makes sense for it? Um, and you, you may think, oh, no, just always go bigger and better, um, bigger and more space. But that's not always the case. It, it's very market specific. Any other questions? That was great. And Victor just said, we have a session about pivot tables on our YouTube. So I'm going to. Unless you have it handy, I was going to put the, the link to our YouTube on here. I thought I put it already. Did I not? You might have, but it was, 
yeah, it's right here. I got it. I can just copy and paste it here. Awesome. Done. Awesome. Yeah, man, those pivot tables can be a lifesaver, especially when you want to organize your your you know lease turn dates so that you know logistically when when that's coming. So you can not only prepare for it, but you can also know it's also a really good way for you to know and establish your business plan and say, okay, I know that in August or maybe in the summer month, I have 30 leases coming due. So I'm going to prepare right now and I'm going to turn all those, either I'm going to turn all those apartments or I'm going to just, you know, increase or, or, you, or you, you also have the opportunity to increase all those 30 to the new market rate without doing anything, or you may not, you know, so it's a good way for you to, to understand the logistics of um, your business plan that way. And so one more thing uh, here, the on the floor plan side of the thing, you can, you can also use this to put into the calculator, um, which it, it has its own calculation here of, of average rents. Uh, but when you're, when you're underwriting, you, you really want to make sure that you get the weighted average rent um, for, you know, per unit. It's basically your average per unit rent. Uh, so you can calculate total revenue uh, from rent and, you know, gather your, gather your NOI and gather your um, going in cap rate so you can analyze the deal that way. So, uh, yeah, needless to say, the rent roll is probably step one when it comes to underwriting. You got to know where your revenue is coming from and where it can go. That's just, you know, one of the, probably one of the top three things that's going to make or break your deal. So, yeah, well said, Ed. Thank you for that. All right. We want to do some... Uh, some underwriting. Did anybody have a deal they wanted to share with us at all that we can just throw in here and see what what comes out? If not, uh, what's what's the graveyard saying, Ed? Do you want to just plug in the rent roll or the one you had pulled up? Yeah, actually, that would uh, that'd be good. So it looks like we're getting, so one, one thing that you mentioned is, you know, there's contractual rent and there's net effective rent because some of these rents may not be what, so for example, this one is less than this one. And it could be that your your actual rent, so, you know, some people may be getting some, some discounts on, or some concessions in their rent. So you want to, you want to go with what we're actually charging out, what it's actually coming into um uh to to your pocket so so let's use let's use this one um as the average so we have a thousand fifty seven on hundred and twelve units one thousand fifty seven hundred and twelve units if I'm not mistaken this was just that ninety percent when we had looked at it. Uh, let's see, this guy. Okay. And I think the price for this, or at least what we had put in, I can't remember if we went in at all, but we're looking at maybe 10 million, but 110, maybe 110 a unit. So let's put, let's put 12 million. That's close. Uh, let's see. It was definitely a C class. <clears throat> and I think we were looking to take rents to, well, this was this was a tricky one. This was a really tricky one because it had a lot of um, housing authority, and it was like halfway through. And the play was either going to be well, three plays: completely get rid of all a section eight and go all the way to market and just turn it, flip it with like twenty grand a unit, and make it you know like 
high class B um, and go to like 1600, which was pretty close to market around that area. Or you could keep it the same, which is, uh, uh, but but then drive drive some of those rents up to close to 1300. Or uh, go all in with the section eight housing, put in, put in for voucher increases and bring it up to, you know, that pretty much close to that 1600 still without putting in as much um, uh, work per unit in, into this. So there were, there were several different ones and, and, and it affected the returns differently. Um, so that, you know, that's just one, one part of the complexities of, of underwriting deals. So let's just say that we're going to keep it all the same, but we're going to drive rents to $1,300. And that, that's been corroborated. We've done our walkthroughs. We've talked to people in the market. We've talked to the experts, et cetera. And uh, <clears throat> let's see. We're going to say that we want to drive occupancy up. Oh, hey, there's Marcel. What's going on, boss? Welcome. Yeah, the third option could be more attractive, uh, too, because there's less money up front that you put in uh, on rehab. Um, but, you know, there's there's also an added complexity to turning everything to Section 8, unless you're an absolute pro at it, right? There's, there's some more costs involved um, from a personnel standpoint. Um, so it's just, there's just a little bit more complexity to it. And there, there is, there is a downside as much as there is an upside, right? Your maintenance costs will likely go up potentially if you want to, you know, provide a decent place to live for these people. Um, and, and, you know, the amount of money that you put in on the long term might be a little bit more, um, you know, depending on, depending on, you know, how, how you, screen your tenants so uh but yeah third option is actually what we considered going all in all the way um and and just investing a little bit more not only yeah more constant maintenance correct uh going going all in on that and also spending a little bit more on personnel having somebody that's you know strictly there for uh, section eight etc in addition to the manager um so and it, and it was still potentially, you know, going to be really good. We just had to make sure that we could get those rents. Um, so anyway, yeah, great question. Exit cap, uh, I think 650, you know, was was great for this. You know, it was the Atlanta metro area. And, uh, you know, 650 for a C-class in Atlanta, I think is, is pretty good. I think the current cap rate was around six. And so we were hoping to hold for five years and and, you know, increasing on a, um tenth of a percent per year on on the exit on the cap rate uh calculating the exit cap rate so with that with those little factors involved we were seeing a potential upside of uh 768 at 12 million right so we're like oh, okay 112 units if we're only looking at a $768,000 upside we might not be able to buy it this uh, this much. If it's 112 units, it's a lot of units. So I might even want to see that upside way, way above, uh, you know, a million dollars. So let's see, we want to do maybe 11 million. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right, so if we put in 90, which is I think what we were thinking about putting in right under 100, um, and I think it ended up trading at like 104, um, you know, 1.7 upside, 1.7 million upside. That's doable. I think, you know, I think that's a doable upside on here, uh, a decent hold. And if we want to look at potential year one, um, returns, let's say we bring it from 1,057, maybe we can bring it up 150 bucks to carry the one. $1,200 at a uh, 90, 90%, I guess we'll sell it, we'll be at 95. So let's see at 90%, uh, make sure I have the right expense ratio formula on here. Uh, 
All right, yeah, cash cash flow on year one is close to you know four percent. And again, this is a very basic, very 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 basic little napkin calculator. So there are other things that could go in here that could even drive that up or drive it down. Um, so just so just FYI, you can see a little bit of the cash from cash there. Now the big thing here was going to be the 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 loan, right? On 112 units, I mean we're we're looking at well. The, the good thing was that being that it was, you know, a, a section eight, we could probably get a little bit more favorable terms on that. And I forget what kind of terms we were getting. Well, was that we were looking at five and a quarter from the current holder or something like that? Yeah, about five and a quarter. And I think I think the LTV was around 65 percent, if I'm not mistaken. Let's just say that you can get that five and a quarter. Oh, back then, you could get five and a quarter. Nowadays, you probably can't get anywhere near to that. Can I have five and a quarter? <laughs> what? Um, oh, quarter. Right. Well, needless to say, they didn't go for the $11 million, right? So they sold it for, for higher than that. But if we could have gotten it at $11 million, that would have been a that would have been a deal for sure, right? Going in, you know, you know, purchase um, cap rate at purchase higher than your, you know, interest rate. So we're good there. Um, yeah. So um, any questions so far on this before we kind of conclude uh, whether this is a good deal to take into further analysis or not? Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, so when when somebody else buys the property for more than what you're willing to offer, is it because they ran their numbers different, or why is it that they pay more and it was a deal for them but not a deal for y'all? Yeah, man, that's a great question. That's a really I have a quick question. I have a quick answer for that. Um, yeah, because I had this happen to me recently. Um, the biggest thing is cost of capital. If you have a GP team and you have multiple people involved, and you have a sponsor, you have to pay X dollar nine. You're getting your investors and you're telling them you're going to pay them this amount. If you have a fund, for example, if you have a really wealthy group of friends that just want to put their money together and buy stuff or have, have a presence in a location where they can load their expenses. For example, if I'm in a market and I have a property management company that I own and I have um, employees and I'm expanding, my expenses are going to be lower than someone coming into the market for the first time or someone who doesn't have their own property management company. Now, all those different components, it's, the deal and the numbers are exactly the same. A lender, you're not going to get much different between two lenders. Now, if you own that too, then by all means, be my guest. Like you just have every vertical covered. But the biggest part is, is remember, we have to cater to our investors first. Mm -hmm. You're giving them only 70% of the returns most of the time, maybe 80 if you're doing 80-20, that means someone else might have a 20% advantage if they're not raising their money from other investors. They have they have 20% more spread off the jump. Now factor in the idea that out of that 20%, you're going to have a capital raiser, an operator, an asset manager, a project manager, a sponsor. All of a sudden, you're like, I need bigger spread. And that's a one big component of it. Um, and that's why I personally say every week, and like I was saying earlier, you really got to know your market and have people there. Have the right people there have a team there, have people who um, know the market, know the insurance guy, know the property manager, management company, know the tax city and like know okay. the different counties, know what makes that city go. The city you guys all live in. If I asked you a question about it, you would know the answer. If I told you if I crossed the street, is my rent going up or down? You would know the answer. If you don't know the answer for the market you're looking in, which I only invest, I mostly invest out of state, so I don't know every location, but I have people there that do. And that's very important. Yeah, great. First of all, that was not a quick answer, Ed. Just wanted to throw that out there. I don't I never um, have quick answers. You yeah, you're right, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> I should I should have known better. <laughs> no, no, that but I agree. Quick I, in my book. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was that was actually that was really great. Um, I would the only thing I would add is that you know it, it is multivariable, man. There's so many reasons they could have ran their numbers differently. They could have gotten a different, you know, they could be more aggressive when it comes to their risk aversion. 
or they're not as risk averse as, you know, say I would be, or they're banking that, you know, the, the tax assessment is going to, uh, it's not going to reassess. So it's going to stay the same, right? So taxes are, you know, a big, big part that drives your, your costs up. Like Ed said, in Florida. insurance as well. Yep. The cost mm. of capital, like Ed said, but then not only that, um, the equity that's coming in, is it, a, you know, are they buying this thing cash? If they're buying it cash, they're, they're, you know, their, um, their risk is so much lower than if they, you know, uh, leverage it out. Right. Um, do they have a ton of cash that there's, that's an equity firm that they're sitting on that they have to get rid of? Okay, fine. I'll take a 2% return more than losing, you know, 6% on the inflation. Right. Or you know, they want to exchange. Yeah. Even if it's, even if it's breaking even, right. So there's so many, because we've lost out on several ones where people come have come in higher. Um, now I will say, that the ones that we've been serious about and traded higher than we were going in have retraded several times, right? So people are going out there and they're putting in high numbers because a lot of it is people being desperate too. They just, they just want to buy a property or they want to get in the game and it's just not a good time for this price, right? It just doesn't make sense, right? So, you know, we always recommend people using traditional underwriting methodologies to make sure that your underwriting is solid so that you can provide the returns to your investors that you promise them and then exceed that expectation. Right. And so, yeah, I, I hope, I hope that helps answer your, your question there. Yeah, that definitely helped on that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. I got, outbid, I got outbid on 88 units by cash buyers from Europe. <laughs> there was nothing I could have done with the underwriting to fix that. Unfortunately. What's up, Mario? Can I ask a question, guys, regarding what drives the return section uh, between cash flow and stabilize? What drives those numbers? Right over here. Uh huh. Yeah. So the year one is driven by driving rents from where it is currently uh, to, you know, depending on what you think you could drive them to that first year, right? So you drive them to this to this mm -hmm. point, which is going to increase your cap rate. Um, sorry, it's going to increase your NOI, and then mm -hmm. your NOI is just you know you you take out you take out your loan uh, essentially your your payment, mm -hmm. and that's that's what's what's left over is basically your cash flow, right? And then so you then mm -hmm. so you factor that into whatever equity you invested into that. And so it kind of, it's a really, really, really rough return number, like I said, right? There are a lot of other variables mm -hmm. in, in an analyzer that will kind of play into that as well. But it, this is a good way for you to get a rough idea of where you're going to be um, on that. Now, as far as stable is concerned, then we're looking at uh, pushing it all the way up to, uh, you know, your, your, your market rates that you're shooting for, right? On that last year mm -hmm. that that you stabilize. Um, and then of course, at that okay. point, it's always going to be even higher. And then, you know, we factor that um, from your, from the equity that you, you know, you used to purchase the, the building, right? So that point is the return on those initial investments at stabilization. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. One thing, one thing I want to add real, I'm not even going to say real quick anymore because all those didn't call me out on it. <laughs> <laughs> you got me scared to talk now, bro. Come on. You got that. Uh, so one man, thing, I'll, <laughs> one thing, I'll, last thing I want to add is, um, remember this is just scratching the surface of the underwriting. For example, Michael Blank has been on the calls, and a lot of people here use his calculator. It's really helpful when you can say, "Hey, from year one or zero, I guess acquisition to year one, based on how much rehab I think I can do and how many units I have turning." I can rent it by this much. What's a realistic number? And that comes with kind of like the previous question of if you don't, you're kind of spitballing and ballparking what you can actually turn over in a year, you might either estimate very low because you haven't done it before or too high, which I hope you're not doing. So you may be conservative, like not realize how much you can really turn over in a year and guess that number low. And then all of a sudden all your numbers change because it should have been higher. So keep that in mind too. And that's a like an equation that I guess a situation could leave for another day because that gets very really complicated and it's definitely not uh, scratching the surface underwriting at that point. Um, 
but essentially what it is is fine tuning and knowing and talk and working with people who have done multiple deals in that area and say hey i have xyz resource i think we can get xyz done in this time frame which is mostly the rehab stuff and then you know you can increase your rents um for anyone that's familiar with the sda calculator you see year one to year two you don't want that margin to be too big because then everything else gets pushed up and your numbers look a lot bigger it's not realistic expectations so be careful of that as well okay thank you guys awesome well thanks everyone this has been great a lot of fun once again thank you all for coming out and uh spending your tuesday night with us we hope that you got some value out of this and that uh, you continue to take action and learn about multifamily real estate if you have any questions around um anything really but specifically underwriting please give us a call shoot us a text uh hit us up on our instagram uh, we'd be happy to help so with that you'll have a wonderful wonderful tuesday night <laughs>